There was a significant security weakness found in version 3 of the SSL protocol, also known as SSL v3. The SSL protocol, if you don't already know, is used to encrypt data between you and a web server with which you might be communicating. Encryption, if you recall, is a mathematical transformation of data with a key. The input to that transformation is known as plain text, plain text, and the output of that transformation is known as the ciphertext, the ciphertext. If encryption is done correctly, then there is an assurance that the data is kept confidential and it cannot be easily deciphered by any malicious party who lacks knowledge of that key. This weakness in SSL v3 that I'll describe shortly and which has been given the somewhat catchy name of Poodle allows a bad guy to decrypt some of this SSL traffic. They may then get enough of your information to access your online accounts. So the way the attack works is as follows. Let's imagine you're browsing the web and you have some data and I'll draw that data here as a rectangle. A portion of this data let's say is extremely sensitive and I'll shade that part here in red. Now imagine that you're transmitting that data to a web server and you're using SSL to encrypt that data. In SSL v3, the first thing that's done as part of encrypting this data is to compute a message authentication code or a MAC. Essentially, all this MAC does is it serves as a type of cryptographic checksum, if you will, for ensuring the integrity and the authenticity of that original data. More so, the MAC can only be computed by parties who have access to the right cryptographic keys. These parties would be, in theory, the original sender and the recipient of the data. So if a bad guy tries to modify this data on route, since he doesn't have access or may not have access to the cryptographic keys, he won't be able to update the MAC value itself when he modifies the data. And so any attempts he makes to tamper with this portion of the data will be noticed. So after this MAC value is appended, then there's some padding that has to be placed after that data in the SSL v3 protocol. And this padding is merely placed because many popular encryption algorithms require the data that they are encrypting to have a length that is a multiple of a particular size. So for example, for the advanced encryption standard or AES algorithm, the length has to be a multiple of 16 bytes. For the data encryption standard or DES, DES, the length has to be a multiple of eight bytes. And if you don't have the right length, you can just artificially pad your data until it has the right length. Now the padding approach that is used in SSL v3 is, is extremely simple. That padding basically comprises a bunch of random byte values, and I'll denote those values by x's, and then a final value that indicates the size of the padding, how many bytes were padded. And I'll use the letter s to describe that size. Now this approach seems to be very simple. It seems to be otherwise innocuous. And unfortunately, it actually contains a very subtle but deep flaw. The full payload, which comprises the original data, the MAC, and the padding, as part of SSL v3, is then encrypted. And the method that's used to encrypt that data is known as the cipher block chaining mode, or CBC mode. Cipher block chaining mode. And as I mentioned, we often abbreviate cipher block chaining as CBC. The way that CBC encryption works is by taking your data and breaking it up into blocks or chunks. Each block or chunk is encrypted and then the encrypted value is used or incorporated into the encryption process for the next block. The way that a new value is incorporated is by means of what's called the exclusive OR or the XOR operation, which is often denoted as a plus sign with a circle around it. During the decryption process, each block is decrypted. The effects of that XOR have to be removed, and you proceed from that point onward, essentially going backwards. The decryption process has to start with the last block of data, and it makes its way back to the first block of data. And that should make some sense. Decryption reverses the process of encryption. Since encryption starts with the first block and ends with the last block, it would make sense, it stands to reason, that decryption would involve starting with the last block and making your way back to that first block. After the recipient decrypts, then it'll look at this last piece of data right here that specifies the length of the padding. It'll know how much padding to remove. 
and then it knows that what was placed just before that padding was the MAC value of the original payload. The MAC value can be verified with respect to that data that preceded it. And if that verification process checks out, then the recipient is confident, or so he thinks, that the data was not tampered with. If the process doesn't check out, if the MAC check fails, then the recipient will drop the connection, which effectively lets everybody know that something went wrong, that the MAC value was not correct. It turns out, however, that because of how this padding was done, a bad guy can indeed tamper with the data that was sent on route, and he can get away with it just often enough to pose a problem. And beyond that, the bad guy can do this in a way that allows him to decipher some of what was sent. So let's imagine a bad guy is actively eavesdropping on your network, and he sees that this data right here is going by. He will quickly modify it on route by merely copying one of the internal blocks, and in this case, we'll pick the block that contains the encryption of the most sensitive data, and this block will be copied to this final section that contained the padding and the size of the padding in it. And so when the recipient receives this modified data, what he'll do is he'll proceed like he did before. He'll decrypt what was sent block by block, and next he'll examine the padding length value. Now because this last block was modified by the attacker, the padding length value that was originally there will have been overridden. Most of the time when the data is decrypted, the resulting padding length is going to be different than what it was before. And if that's the case, when the recipient strips off the padding bytes and then does the MAC check, that MAC check will fail because it's going to be checking the wrong set of bytes for the MAC. And that will effectively indicate to the recipient that something is wrong. The recipient will terminate the connection, thereby effectively sending a message, so to speak, to the sender that this particular process has been rejected and whatever happened has failed. But once in a while, once in a while, actually one in 256 times to be precise, the attacker will get lucky and the padding length values will just happen to match. And the bad guy will know that this match occurred because the recipient will not have rejected the transaction. Everything will continue to go on and move forward. And that's a sign to the attacker that he actually managed to pick the right value this time he got lucky. And so in this case, the bad guy knows the padding value and he knows the encrypted value of the previous block because that's what he saw go by. And so from those two pieces of information, since he knows what was padded and he knows the actual previous block that was encrypted, he can derive the last character of the missing piece of information, which is this plain text block corresponding to the sensitive content block that he placed in this last section. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, this seems like a lot of effort for what seems like very little gain. The bad guy has only a 1 in 256 chance of succeeding, and he only learns the last character. It turns out that the adversary can actually get this process repeated multiple times. And not only that, he can do that in a way such that the characters in the copied block are shifted each time he learns one of the characters. And proceeding in this way, after a few, maybe tens of thousands of transactions, he can learn several encrypted blocks, and that can be done fairly quickly online. Now, the way this attack would be automated in practice is through the use of JavaScript. The attacker will first set up a web page. When the recipient views that web page, the page will initiate a number of HTTP or web requests to the web server. This web server will be one where the adversary wants to compromise the user's account. For example, it could be a server corresponding to web-based email. These requests can then be designed to carry sensitive data. And one such example is a user authentication cookie. A cookie is just a small piece of data that allows a website to know that you are who you say you are without having to confirm that information with the website each time. So for example, cookies are what let you enter your password into a site just once and browse through that site over a period of days or weeks without being prompted for another password. If you steal someone's cookies, or their cookie values, so to speak, you can impersonate them. And when that's done correctly, the adversary will learn the cookie value, and he can then impersonate the user. So this attack allows the adversary to potentially learn cookie values and take over the user's account. And that's the attack in a nutshell. So I want to point out a few things. First of all, I want to point out that SSL version 3 is quite old. 
It was developed 18 years ago, actually, in 1996. It's so old that it's been long superseded since then by improved protocols. For example, the TLS protocol, and now TLS has had even multiple versions. And by the way, TLS itself was introduced 15 years ago in 1999. And for the most part, people have abandoned SSL v3 in favor of TLS. Now, normally when you have such an old protocol that people have generally abandoned, then any type of weakness in that protocol is often a non-issue. And so you might be wondering, why is this poodle attack getting so much attention? Well, it turns out that most web servers and web browsers still support SSL version 3. And the reason for that is they have to ensure they are backwards compatible with old systems. So at the beginning of the SSL handshake, so to speak, there's a version negotiation phase where each party tries to figure out what versions the other party supports. The goal is to get to some type of common denominator, a version that both sides support. Now, if an attacker interferes with that process in a clever way, he can force both sides into thinking that SSL v3 is the only version they both support. And so he can effectively force this attack to take place by making the parties involved downgrade what version of SSL they're using. The second thing I want to point out is that this attack is fairly involved. It obviously requires the attacker to set up a web page with the appropriate JavaScript. It requires the attacker to play the role of a middleman in a very active way where they can literally tamper with data going to and from a recipient and a sender. And that obviously requires a certain set of resources to carry out effectively. The third thing I want to point out is that the only easy solution is to disable SSL v3 entirely. That ensures that nobody's using this bad version, this corrupted version, and everyone will at least be using a newer version of TLS, and as such can ensure that they're not going to be susceptible to these types of padding attacks. And so the last thing I want to point out is that Poodle, which is a name that was given to this attack, actually stands for Padding Oracle on Downgraded Legacy Encryption. That name comes from the fact that the attack involves, number one, taking advantage of how padding is done in SSL, or in SSL v3 to be more precise. The term Oracle refers to the idea that the server might be queried multiple times and its responses are used. In other words, the server is kind of like an Oracle. We have to monitor whether the server accepts or rejects what was sent to it. And the terms downgraded legacy encryption refer to the idea that you have to trick the two parties in the transaction to downgrade their version of SSL or TLS to SSL version 3. So this attack has a common vulnerabilities and exposures or CVE value of 2014 3566 and it was discovered by Boda Muller, Tai Duong, and Christoph Kotovich.